All right, everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob at Smirking Gun Reviews. It is Monday. It's time for Better Call Saul. I hope you guys are ready. Okay, so we are up to, it's season four, episode three. It's called Something Beautiful. So if you haven't seen that episode, please go watch it because there are full of spoilers here. Uh, I put up a nacho wallpaper today because he's kind of like one of the major focuses of this. So, goddamn, <laughs> okay? This is great television. I don't know why it's on Monday nights, okay? I, it should be on Sunday night. They're putting, you know, you've got Fear the Walking Dead and Preacher, and I get it with Preacher, but Fear the Walking Dead should be on Monday nights compared to Better Call Saul, because this deserves to have the position of better ratings, because this is still a show up there as Getting as good as Breaking Bad as far as like storytelling and stuff and acting and all that stuff. This does not disappoint. Again, I can't believe it. Oh my god. I'm fucking geeking out here. So, this is the place, this is the channel, okay? To get your real geek on for Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad uh, going forward. Because man, I feel like I need to just do Breaking Bad at this point. So... There is so much to say. Okay, so let's just get into it. I'm already a minute 32 and I haven't really talked about anything. So, commitment. Doing what you have to do is basically the name of the game this week. So, let's just get to, to Nacho's side of this story. So, after last week's events where Gus Fring went out of his way and never does this to take out Nacho's partner uh, and basically to let Nacho know the Salamancas don't know what you've done, but I do, and you work for me now. And he kills his partner. And I asked last week, like, what are they going to do? They're just going to leave him with the body, right? How is he going to figure out what to do with it? Well, as usual, Gus has a plan to help get rid of this body and make sure that Nacho doesn't get blamed for it and to make sure that they can't get tied to it and that the Salamancas have no idea what's going on. And Gus's boss, uh, like upper boss next to Don Eladio, doesn't know who's just, what's going on. Attention to detail. It's the same thing I said last week. It's currently going on now because now we get to keep seeing how good Gus was at his job before he met Walter White. Not that he was bad after he met Walter, but we get to see truly how good this guy was at doing what he does. And it's Committing to the plan, attention to detail, and doing it. You having to not stray and just stay the damn course. So, the plan, which wasn't evident right away, because the opening of this is uh, one of Fring Gus's guys uh, purposely runs over like a tire spike tr uh, strip. And you're like, okay, what's this? And, you know, I should have thought about it, but it just, it's, you get so lost in it that you don't know what's going on all the time, or at least I don't know. Like, I'm just so trying to figure out, okay, what are they doing? Well, then, you know, they, they get in there and they just start, they open up the trunk <laughs> and there's a dude's body in there that they killed that night. So that's what this all is. This is a setup. This is to make sure that that nobody finds out that they killed this guy. So they put his body in the car and they just unload their guns into this car. <laughs> just, I mean, for a long time. This is like Peter going, ah, long, okay? This is like long. They blast everything. And then, you know, this is Nacho. Nacho's watching this. Uh, and then they finally shoot the, the guy in the head. And then poor Nacho has to get in the car and take a round in the arm. And so you're like, and then they, they, he goes out to like a spot far enough away from the car so that it looks like uh, he's, you know, crawled away from the car. Speaking of the car, like they have like trails. Like, they've committed to, like, putting broken stuff of the car, like, along the way. Like, in it from another car. 
So, th I mean, it's just the detail. So Nacho's out there ready to like, okay, can I make the phone call basically to call like, we know, I didn't really know right away who he was going to call. I thought maybe he'd be calling 911 or something, but that's stupid of me because these are drug dealers. They would want to know, like the cops would want to know what are you doing out there? Why did somebody shoot the fuck out of your car and your friend? But before you can barely get out the words, when can I make the can I make the call? Does the dude shoot him right in the stomach and puts him down? And it's kind of strange because well, it's kind of just not strange, but they're almost enjoying it. The way that he they say well, you got to make it look real. I don't think it, and Nacho did not know he was going to take that round in the stomach. So now he's dying, all right? First he just was, you know, a flesh wound. Now he's really dying. <laughs> and so he calls, and who does he call? He calls the Psycho Brothers. <laughs> Hector's nephews with the skull boots that cause all sorts of havoc on Breaking Bad. And they are just as creepy here as they've ever been. I've said this before in other episodes, ever since they showed up here. And they just don't seem to be in that big of a hurry. <laughs> but they never have been. I mean, these are two guys that crawled on their stomachs to go to a, uh, what do you call it, like a shrine so that they could, you know, put out like an offering to kill Walter White. So they, they, they're patient, but a little too patient because it takes them forever, it seems, to like look at the crime and go uh, find uh, Nacho's, you know, almost dead body out in the middle of nowhere. So, <laughs> they're, they're, then they get him in the car and they still, they're not really going anywhere. They're looking at his wound and they're making him talk like, what'd you see? He's just like, Silver Firebird, man, I didn't see anybody. So then we have to jump, just to keep this like kind of in order, to where Jimmy, is talking to Mike about the job to steal the Hummel from last week. Now this is not a surprise that uh, Mike turns it down. Mike doesn't need this. Mike's got his easy money, collecting it from, you know, Fring's business at Madrigal. So stealing a Hummel for four grand, putting unnecessary risk on yourself just in case, who knows, chaos, you know, could happen. It's just a crazy world. So for four grand, it's not worth taking Jimmy's job. But it's nice to see this scene because they really do seem to have like a rapport that's not animosity towards each other yet. Because, you know, Mike does say, I'm sorry about your brother. Uh, and that he should take care of himself. And that this job isn't for him either. Mike's looking out for Jimmy. Because if you really listen to how Jimmy's talking, he is really heading towards from just slipping Jimmy to Saul. Like, you can hear it in that kind of trying to, the, the, the lawyer, salesman, criminal part of him really starting to come out. And kind of almost in a desperate way. Um, and Jimmy just can't understand it. But that's because Mike's not about to tell him that he's working for a major cartel, uh, you know, as a security consultant. Because <laughs> that's just shit Jimmy doesn't need to know. And I don't think Mike would ne unnecessarily tell anybody his business, you know, unless it was beneficial for him or Gus or if he absolutely had to. And I don't think he can trust Jimmy right now. And even further on along in the story, I don't think Mike really ever really trusts Jimmy anymore, if he ever did. I think he knows how, when and how and why to go to Jimmy for things. Or even, you know, later on when he saw. So, yeah, Jimmy moves on. And then he goes to the veterinarian where Mike had, you know, first started getting jobs uh, to, you know, start making some money to help out his daughter or his, uh, his, his son's wife, his daughter-in-law. So he's trying to find somebody else to help him steal this Hummel. And again, he, you know, he steps in, tells the veterinarian to give him the phone and like, hey man, like... No offense to your job, but I, you know, he, he talks to this guy and again, the salesman comes out, the, 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 the slick, you know, slipping Jimmy type, you know, who, who can get people to do things. And he does. 
And for a second, when they go to break into this guy's place, the, the, the effects or the copy machine place, I thought it was Jimmy with like a fake beard on. I was like, well, why? But it's not. Uh, it's his guy that he's got working there. And immediately, I, get, I, I don't know, I didn't like how this was going just because the way it felt like he wasn't putting, I don't know, the way he was touching things. But, of course, there's got to be a wrinkle because that would be too easy, right? Just to go in and break in and get out. Can't have that. So we have our fax, you know, our copy machine, the owner of the company there. He's staying there because he's on the outs with his wife for buying her a vacuum cleaner. Uh, so <laughs> Jimmy's would-be uh, assistant here, Robber, is hiding under the desk. Well, this guy is having trouble sleeping, having some drinks, calling his wife, asking her why he has to stay on the couch or buying her a gift. Hey, buddy, I don't think it's the gift uh, that you got her a gift. It's just you got her the wrong gift. You got her something to use to clean with, okay? Women aren't really, I don't know too many women that, uh, uh, look, everybody wants a vacuum cleaner, but you just don't give it as a gift, <laughs> okay? <laughs> he just don't do it. So it was a little silly. He's like, why? I got you something nice. It's expensive. You know, and hey, simple male-female problem, you know, miscommunication. But seriously, guys, don't get your wife a vacuum cleaner for unless she specifically tells you to get that for her as a gift. Anyway, who am I to say who we get whatever you want? I don't care, but <laughs> it just seems like a bad idea. And then he starts calling carry out where which now the guy has to wait for him to like go to the bathroom just so he can make a phone call to tell Jimmy get me out of here so time goes by now he's sitting there listening eating his pizza playing solitaire listening to self-help books on tape or CD or whatever it is <laughs> so you know it's been a while this guy's stuck into the desk and so Jimmy sets out the car alarm, a noble try, I guess, the first try, but the guy doesn't even barely get out the door, turn off his key, you know, turn off his car, goes right back in. So Jimmy has to try again. This time he, uh, he hits the alarm again. This time he puts the car like out of park and pushes it away so that the guy has to leave the place and they get away. Finally, um, this isn't breaking bad tense, but it's more like funny tense. Like, like, just this simple job can't get done uh, as easily as it should have been. Uh, and they walk away just kind of like, hey, that was fun. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> like, in the end, like, he could have been pissed off or whatever. But, it, hey, four grand a piece for, you know, a little inconvenience, you know, having to sit under a desk for a little while. Eh, not too bad. So, then we have Kim. And Kim seems to be having some sort of... PTSD. Now, I don't know if that it probably has to stem somewhat from the accident. Um, but, I mean, she's kind of having this like these like fugue moments, which is really weird uh, when she's, you know, hanging out with the people from Mesa Verde, you know, her clients with the banks who are trying to get big expansions done. And I'm, I don't know what's going on with her. Like PTSD from an accident or or the shock of chuck's death or what i'm a little confused in fact if you know like i've been i paid attention <laughs> to this um so maybe you know somebody else can clue me into like because she gives jimmy the letter which i was surprised she did and the check for five grand i'm also you know i'm surprised she did either of that i thought maybe she had, would give him a fake letter if she was going to give him the letter but she gives him the letter and you know it it turns out that you know he it was a nice letter but it was also a letter written like if chuck had changed if this letter had been done more recently uh this that would not be the same letter this was written when chuck was kind of proud of jimmy when he was in the mail room and so i'm you know if, if chuck i'm surprised chuck didn't change his will to be honest with you. But it was nice that it was a nice letter and that gave Jimmy some kind of like, you know, oh, well at this point in time, he didn't like me, you know, kind of thing. 
and Kim just kind of loses it. Now, like quietly loses it, but she, you know, she starts breaking down and crying. And I, I don't know if it's because of how, like, now that the red letter's been read, and uh, you know, she had gone off on Howard that everything's kind of affecting her, or is this some kind of like, I don't know, guilt about Chuck or something? I don't know, but it's a really good performance by her. Um, and so then we get to where <laughs> we get to connect back with uh, Nacho. So Nacho uh, ends up going to the, the same vet that uh, Jimmy was just at to get a job and, and fix his fish problem. Uh, I don't know. Fish get sick, I guess, and you take them to the vet, and I don't know what they do. But apparently Jimmy's fish should feel better. I don't know, but uh, this, you know the nephews walk in to the veterinary shop, give the girl the thousand yard stare, and <laughs> so the next thing you know, he's like they've got the vet, you know, uh, taking out the bullet and stuff uh, for from Nacho. Now, I love the little moment where he's like telling him truthfully, like I don't know if it perforated your bowel, but you know it's gonna get infected, be the worst infection you ever had, and you'll die. But he don't know. So just he gives him the whole change of bandages thing and then whispers, don't ever contact me again. Cartel shit is too fucking close. You know, like, I don't want to get near that shit. So uh, we have that. Now, this is the part. So Nacho's basically hopefully going to be okay. I still don't think. Like maybe this is his near-death experience and he won't die. But I don't know. Still just doesn't feel right for him. Um, then you have Gus talking to his boss about, and this is it. <laughs> this is the part where I just, I was like, oh my God, this is happening. Because right before this happened, okay, this scene that we're going to talk about is they were talking, him and his, uh, the boss above him, we're talking about distribution that they got hit. You know, somebody knows our business, even though it's Gus. Gus is manipulating things. Uh, and so they're talking about buying product from somebody that they don't know. And when he's going into this, like, I think it's like a university. The first thing I was thinking about was, you know, we never saw Gus's family. And I think that that will be something interesting. I hope that we tackle that a little bit, like Gus's kids and his wife and stuff, because they never appeared in Breaking Bad. We know he has a wife and he has kids, but that's not what we got here. <laughs> we got something way fucking better, man. We got Gail Bedecker. Oh my God. We got Gail. I couldn't fucking believe it. And he's being totally Gail. So that's why I had to put up his singing uh, on here. Uh, and I don't have the audio on for a reason because I don't want to get any kind of thing. But like, Gail was such a great character from Breaking Bad. He was taken from us far, far, far too soon. He was one of the most fun characters on the show. And he's such a delightful nerd. And the song that he's singing is the Element Song, okay? And uh, it's a song that is sung by musical humorist and lecturer Tom Lair. Uh, this came out in 1959. So if you've heard this song, it's, and it's uh, done to like the Pirates of the Penzance. So it's just perfect. A perfect introduction to the character if you people that don't know Gale. Uh, on Breaking Bad, he was going to be uh, Walter's like original assistant. And he is smart as, just about as smart as Walter. And you can tell in this scene, you know, he's talking about the, the chemic, the, the products that they're testing, which is, you know, clearly meth. And that, you know, he tells him the percentages and he tells him basically in the end that they're dog shit. <laughs> I wish I had the audio playing. <laughs> but um, he wants in, he wants in, he wants in, he wants in. But Gus, as we know, he's like, no, I cannot let you. It is not time yet. And so any of us Breaking Bad fans, this is the kind of Easter fucking egg we wanted. And this, I can't believe. And I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope this is not the last we see of Gale in this because it would be so 
great to just have little bits of Gale thrown in here. Just kind of like this, like, I don't know, where, you know, he's like, he'd be like Boba Fett, okay, where he just kind of shows up here and there and then just does something and like, he's barely in it, but you get just enough of him to where people can be still obsessed with him, like I am. So, that's just the cherry on top of another great goddamn episode. So, uh, yeah, that's all I have uh, for this episode, even though it's just fantastic. Gail, Gail, I love the actor. I can't remember his name. He's on Billions, too. He's really good in everything. Um, so, anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, I hope you guys liked it. So, yes, if you like this video, please hit the like button. Subscribe, comment, share. Share this with your friends. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode because I loved it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we will see you next week for another episode of Better Call Saul. This is Robert Smirk again reviews saying check out the channel. We got plenty of stuff on here to look at and we will see you next time. Bye.